God, you're so wonderfully awesome. We ask on today that you would open our minds, God, to receive all that you'd have for us to receive. We pray that as we embark on this series for the love of money, to teach people correctly about the tithe, to correct them about finance and about money, that you, God, would be glorified in the truth that is given out. We ask that you would allow your Holy Spirit to just open our eyes of understanding that we may truly know without any doubt what your intent is for us concerning money. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so here's how this series is going to break down. Today we're going to deal with an introduction and overview of the entire series. And then next week we'll deal with Jesus' words on tithing, and I may try to put some of that in today, uh, toward, the, toward the end. Uh, we'll deal with Jesus' words on tithing, uh, and then I'll deal briefly with an overview of the law. The cool thing about the Freedom Center is that I think we've done a fairly good job of teaching people about Christians' relationship to the Old Testament law. And I, I think we have I, done a fairly good job of that. So I don't have to spend a lot of time about that, but we do need to deal with it somewhat. Uh, we'll deal with the multiple tides represented in Scripture. There are at least four tithes that are represented in Scripture. We're going to deal with the four tithes that are represented there. Uh, because, you know, quite frankly, we you know, currently just deal with just the one. Um, we're going to deal with the uh, Levite tithe of the tithe. And we're going to deal with the festival tithe. We're going to deal with the Levitical tithe and the poor tithe. Then we'll deal with tackling Malachi, which is the home of the tithe monster. <laughs> That's Malachi. Then we'll deal with the tithe in Genesis, which is Abraham's tithe. And lastly, we'll conclude in the book of Hebrews. And that's essentially how this will break down. So when we're done, uh, we will have covered comprehensively what the Bible has to say about tithing. As opposed to many of the infomercials that are running out of pulpits today about the one verse people are beaten with, that Malachi 3.10. We're let me just push pause real quick and make an appeal to all those listening, to the clergy that are listening, to pastors that are listening. I beg you, I implore you, stop. Stop fleecing people for their money. Money is temporary. It is going away. When Jesus comes back, the amount of money you possess is irrelevant. God does not spend energy on temporary things. We, we as believers are focused on things that are eternal. Stop spending the majority of your sermon times on money. Let's press play. Okay. All right, so let's go to Matthew 23 and 23. Now, I, I need to make this point to everyone um, kind of as we deal with this. All right, so there is a starting point. And our Bible is, is wrong, right, in, in this sense. Let me, let me explain my statement. Okay, so... Our Bibles, generally speaking, if you have a King James, New King James, NIV, Amplified, Message Bible, New Living Translation, American Standard Bible, New American Standard Bible, 
and the other plethora of versions out there, it's normally broken into two testaments, right? The Old Testament and the New Testament. Generally speaking, the Bible is given to us to begin the New Testament starting with the book of Matthew. Is that correct? That's, that's pretty accurate, right? And how your Bibles are divided. Okay, so that's wrong, right? In, in this sense, that the New Testament um, really begins in the book of Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John actually uh, are still taking place uh, under the existence of the Old Testament law. So the laws that are in play uh, in um, Isaiah or during the time the Psalms are written or Proverbs with Solomon and all the, the, that law that is there is still there in existence, in operation in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Once Jesus Christ gets on the cross, he dies, buried, resurrected on the third day, ascends into heaven, and the Holy Spirit is released. At the releasing of the Holy Spirit is when the New Testament begins. So that delineation will kind of help um, help guide our study because you, you kind of have to know uh, when, when and we'll read Jesus' statements when Jesus is speaking part of what Jesus is speaking is what's coming and you'll, you'll see that he talks about you know it's better that I go away because if I don't go away then the, the spirit cannot come well he's, that is not a present thing that is what's coming and what has to precede that is his death on the cross so, so that so that pivoting uh, for us is important to understand. So that way when we begin to research the words of Jesus and being able to differentiate between what he's talking about in existence now and what is to come, that we're not associating the things that are given to us to do today based on what Jesus was dealing with while the law was still in existence. Okay? All right. Matthew 23 Verse 23 reads, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So, When we point to, well, Jesus talks about the tithe. Uh, well, this scripturally is the only reference that is given. Now, we're going to have to acknowledge that what we just read in the 23rd verse is an admonishment by Jesus to the Pharisees. It wasn't a commendation. It was an admonishment in that what was more important concerning the law, which was justice, mercy, and faith, you've left undone, but then every little mint piece that you have, you pay the title for. So, so, so kind of understand, and we'll get into this more as we go through the series. So imagine then that you go and have like a little bitty garden right in, the, in your backyard. I'm talking about the kind is like three feet by six feet, you know? <laughs> you, got, you, got, you got like four tomatoes that pop up. I mean, they would take one and they, they cut just a piece of it so that they could give the tithes off. I mean, they would go to these crazy extremes. But then someone could have misspoken or done something inappropriate and they apologize to that individual yet they would not show them mercy and Jesus is like the more weightiest of the law you, you, you don't do 
But you're, you're out here paying your tithe. You know, you shouldn't do one without the other. Why? Because Jesus very specifically says, and this is the point that you have to understand, you have neglected the weightier matters of the law. When Jesus is walking the earth, he is still under the law. Very, very important to understand. He's still under the law. So of course when he's talking to the Pharisees, of course when he's dealing with the Pharisees, of course when he talks about the tithe, because the tithe was part of the law. Part of the law. That's going to be important to maintain because as we move through and we begin to deal, just like I said, a brief overview because we dealt with the Freedom Center quite a bit. Uh, for those who are listening on the website, there's a series out there called You Have to Read the Fine Print. And that's a comprehensive series on where the law ends and where the dispensation of grace begins. Uh, so... So when Jesus speaks about the tithe, for us to reference, for anyone to reference that Christians today have to pay tithes because Jesus says pay tithes, have completely missed it. What you've missed is context, temporal context or timeline, historical context of what we're dealing with here. And just in basic conversation, you have to look at that particular verse and realize that Jesus is giving an admonishment to the Pharisees for not dealing with, uh, with, with mercy and for not dealing with um, uh, faith or justice. Okay, so let's look at how the tithe in the Old Testament was was to be dealt with okay so uh, for those who are hearing this word for the first time a tithe simply means tip right so the concept was 10 percent right and 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 there there are some more things that we'll deal with more specifically about 10 percent of what but in this case just think of it as as 10 percent uh, and so in the Old Testament, God commanded the Israelites to give tithes one-tenth of their produce or income for one of three reasons. Now, we'll deal with the fact that income, we utilize income today, uh, substitutionary, when that ought not be. Right? So we won't, we won't take scripture for what it says. We want to try and make scripture relevant for today's times, which is odd. I, I agree in, in, in many cases that we should do that, but you can't really cherry pick what you do that with. You know, either the principles in the Bible are correct and applicable today, or they're not. The culture that the Bible is written in is not relevant to the culture today. Completely different cultures. Right? Here we live in America. America has its own culture and subcultures. Lots of subcultures. Okay? Uh, in, in the Old Testament specifically, you're dealing mostly with the Israelites and that culture. And there are things that they did in, in the Israelite culture that we don't do. That's it. I mean, there is, there is no... Um, emphasis on having a greater or lesser relationship with God based on your ability to assimilate aspects of the Israelite culture into your own life. There's no relevance to that. So to, to imitate the way that they dress or anything of that nature, it's, there, there, there's no point to that. Okay, so now here is generally speaking, and this is the overview piece for you, generally speaking, the tithes were, number one, to support the Levites who were responsible for the tabernacle and worship. Okay, so this is God's plan here. Number two, to support various feasts and sacrifices, some of which lasted more than one or two days and were times of joyous celebration and thanksgiving. Number three, to establish a pool of resources to help the poor, orphans, and widows, 
and strangers in the land. Now, in the New Testament, what you don't have is Christ or the apostles giving any explicit instructions about tithing. However, we did read where Jesus deals with the tithe, verse 23 of chapter 23. Uh, he denounced the hypocritical way that the Pharisees ignored the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith, but those heavy-duty issues by no means negated such lightweight matters as tithing. So what are we to take? And these are some principles for us to consider as we move forward in the series. Number one, as Christians, our allegiance is not to the Old Testament law, which was prim primarily given to Israel, but to Christ. Our giving needs to spring from a love of Christ, not a slavish obedience to a percentage standard. When Abraham gave the first tithe according to the Bible, he did it as an expression of gratitude for God's deliverance of him in battle. Throughout Scripture, loving God and worshiping him are at the heart of tithing. Number three, all of what ultimately comes from and belongs to God, nor just what we give away, but also what we keep. So he has total claim on 100% of our income, not just 10%. 10% makes a great starting point for giving. However, studies indicate that as a group, Christians in the United States give nowhere near that much of their income away to ministries or charities of any kind. In fact, while per capita income has increased, church members have actually decreased their contributions to churches. The New Testament is clear that vocational Christian workers have a right to financial support from those to whom they minister. Likewise, many churches and other ministries assist the poor, orphans, and widows, and strangers. So, it seems legitimate to expect believers to donate money to those causes. And no matter how much we give or to whom, Matthew 23, 23 indicates that our first priority should be to ensure that justice is carried out around us, that we show mercy to our neighbors, and that we practice our faith and not just talk about it. So in the end, it is through obedience that Jesus increases our faith. So now let's take a look at some of the things that we get an overview of the way. Let's take a look at some of the things that kind of put us on the track to to getting in and, and, as I like to term it, becoming scriptorial scientists, taking away all of the, the, the extra things that cloud up scripture and get right to the core of how we are to understand what God is saying. So if you would, take a look at John, the 11th chapter, starting at verse 38. John, the 11th chapter, starting at verse 38. It reads, Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound, hand and foot, with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Alright, so I chose this passage of scripture essentially because I want to expose you all to how identifying the audience in a passage of scripture works 
And this is a principle that you have to grab a hold of as you move through and you read scripture on your own. Being able to target in and identify who the audience is is paramount because it keeps you from taking things that are said and running with them when they are truly not applicable to you or your circumstances. Right? And that, I'm, I'm telling you that by being able to identify the audience properly, it immunizes you from manipulative messages that come from pulpits. Because you already know, someone can't associate your level of faith by hearing what they're saying when what you're reading doesn't match. And that's important. Okay, so let's take a look. Let's go to verse 39. All right, so verse 39 said, Jesus said, take away the stone. Who is the audience? Who is Jesus talking to when he says, take away the stone? Okay, so when we look at the passage of scripture, the people who are with Jesus at that point in time who are near the grave where the stone is against the tomb when he says take away the stone he's talking to them so they can literally put their hands on the stone and move it to the side that's the audience. That's who the audience is. When he says, take away the stone, that's who he's talking to. So, in, in other words, and, and, and forgive me if it seems so elementary to what I'm saying, but it is so very important that you take this approach when dealing with Scripture. That you demystify the Scripture. That you deal with the Scripture for what it is. That you don't use this principle we like to use called eisegesis, which is the concept of reading into scripture what you're carrying with you. You must use exegesis, which means that you take out of scripture what it says, with no pre preconceived ideas or notions about what you want it to say. So it is very simple in that. Take away the stone. So does that mean by faith you and I go find stones to start moving? No! Come on, we're not the audience. We have to just simply deal with it the way that it is. Okay, verse 40. Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Who was he talking to? He was talking, okay, so look, look at this. Martha, verse 39, at the end, Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Who's the audience? Martha. Who's he talking to? Martha. He's talking to Martha. She, she sees, she hears Jesus say, move the stone. They go to move the stone. She goes, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. She's like, uh, it's going to be stinking out here. He's been there four days. So he turns to her and says, did I not tell you that if you believe, you see the glory? That the important thing is understanding that he's talking to Martha. So when we go and we begin, oh, look, you're going to see, just have faith. You're going to see the glory of God revealed. He's going to start moving stones away from your life. What? What? This is what it says. You, when, you, when you move yourself into a place where you're not using basic, sound, fundamental biblical principles to study the word of God, you can be taken away by anything someone says. They, get, they, they, you, they give you some sort of emotional high and then they start telling you, just start looking and next thing you know, you're dropping your rent check or your mortgage check on the altar of steps somewhere. And it has to stop. Just, let's just deal with what it says. So, when he says, if you believe that I not say to you, you will see the glory of God, he's talking to Martha. The audience, Martha. So let's deal with it as it is. 
So let's look at verse 41. He says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Who is he talking to? God the Father, right? He's talking to God the Father. I mean, very, very specific about who he is speaking to. All right, go down. Uh, look at verse 43. Lazarus, come forth. Who is he speaking to? Lazarus, right? So don't be running out here seeing your co-workers acting up in, on the job. He's on the Lazarus, come forth. It, no. That does not work. That is not a correlative situation for you to start calling somebody Lazarus, trying to call them out of their grave. Look at verse 44. Loose him and let him go. Who is he talking to? The, the same people that are here, that, that, uh, that are, are there rather that rolled the stone away, the same that are around him, because he has grave clothes on, and he says, loose him and let him go. He's telling them, simply take the grave clothes off of Lazarus. He is no longer dead. And I know that for some of you, this is completely and utterly shocking. That we can actually take this particular passage of scripture and just simply deal with the way that it is and identify the audience, identify the people being spoken to, identify the circumstances, and not put some sort of supernatural, super spiritual connotation to it. Now, when you, you want to look at the historical significance of it, then you need look no further than the fact that Lazarus was raised from the dead. And for those around them were being prepped for what was to come. But sometimes our focus begins, it gets so narrow that we can't see the forest for the trees. So just taking a very wide angle, fundamental view of what the scripture is saying really helps us. So we're identifying these people. As a matter of fact, look, here's another one. Uh, go to Luke 19. And, and look, you, you can see how, how this works. And you can see, uh, we'll, we'll just deal with the first ten verses here. And we'll, you'll deal with these things. And, these, and, you, and you got these stories that are being told. And you got people who have these, you know, uh, uh, some sort of saying to come out of a, a Sunday. And it's taken out of context. The audience is one person or one group of people. And it's being given to someone else. And then they take it and they run with it. Man, they start building an entire belief system. On something that was never meant for them. And inevitably, it falls. Because it's not based on truth. And oftentimes, that sort of, of belief system, it, it clouds a genuine relationship with God. We substitute these things for a relationship with God. It's like you believe... But you're not walking and talking with, with, with God. You're, you're believing things about God. And, and, and there's a genuineness there that is missed by it. Because we refuse, almost refuse defiantly to just simply take it for what it is. So look at Luke 19. Uh, verse 1. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. There was a really poor joke I had there, but I'm just going to let it go. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. Moving right along. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. 
And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Okay, so let's take a look at verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and, ca and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Who was Jesus talking to? Zacchaeus. That's the audience. It's really that simple. We don't have the liberty to now begin to take things and, and make them, oh, and Jesus is coming, and for you to come down. Come on. Really? We, we really can't do that. We, we literally have to take what the Bible is saying for what it's saying. And understanding when Jesus was talking, he's dealing with Zacchaeus. Now, does that mean that, that Jesus can't, can't speak to you about a, a pride issue that has you thinking more highly of yourself? No. I, I would hope that, that you, you would hear him say that. I hope I, that I would hear Jesus say that. Is that what that is saying? In, in Luke, the 19th chapter, verse 5? No. He's speaking to Zacchaeus. <laughs> That's the audience. Go to Luke the fifth chapter. We want to take you a look and just start getting your mind for how you're identifying who's being spoken to. Because there are some things that, that are said that are specifically for that moment, for that time, for that circumstance. And then there are other times where it's a principle. Now, it takes wisdom to know when it is a principle being discussed or being given and when that the circumstance itself is being spoken to only. And that really is where the, the cloudiness comes in. Is that everything that is said is being taken and run, and run with. And made into a faith walk. And that's not the case. Alright, so Luke the fifth chapter. Uh, verse 20, verse 1. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him, him being Jesus, to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Genesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toyed all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats, so that they both began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch, of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. Verse 4, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Who was Jesus talking to? Simon. Who did Jesus tell to, to launch out into the deep and let down his nets? Simon. We, you know, want to take these as principles when they're not principles. 
This was a unique circumstance based on geography. He's pressed upon the shore, turns around, boat. Now, I am not saying that it is not divine providence. I don't believe in coincidence. But the point is that this, there's a geographical context here that has to be identified. Shore, water, boat. Simon Peter, of course, he's identified. Right? God is omniscient. Simon Peter is told, after everything occurs, to launch out into the deep, and God blesses him tremendously. Now, you want to talk about principles? Okay, let's talk about principles. In this particular passage of Scripture, the audience identified is Simon. Now, personally, I don't own a boat. So, does that mean I can't have a genuine relationship with God? Do I have to have a faith boat? <laughs> Go find some faith water to launch out in? No, that's not the principle. But here is the principle. So, Simon is told by Jesus to launch out into the water, let down his nets for a catch. It begins to unfold. Fish are getting into the nets. It's filling up. He turns to Jesus, gets down on his knees, and repents. So what's the principle? That our relationship with God is not works-based. There was no requirement by Jesus to Peter to repent first and then I'll bless you. The principle that's outlaid in that passage of scripture is that first God blessed him tremendously. Over so much blessing that people around Peter were impacted. And then after the blessing, Peter goes... Depart from me. I'm a sinful man. He repents after. That's, that's the principle. Not, you need to be a partner with somebody who's going to get blessed by God, and then because they blessed by God, you get to get some residual blessings by God. That's foolishness and not of God. We've got to stop manipulating text and be truthful with what is being spoken. Identifying correctly who the audience is and understanding the difference between what is circumstantial and what is principle. I'm gonna end there. I want you to to the best of your abilities, wherever you are um, in your growth and development and maturation, um, this coming week, you know, find a scripture or a passage or two to read, and just for your own aggrandizement, take and write down who's speaking and who's being spoken to. If you, if that's something that you do on a regular basis, you know, if you, through the week, you may pick up the Bible and you may read a passage of scripture or whatnot. If you do that, just, just try and do that. Try and just, who's talking? Who's being spoken to? Because by developing that ability, by being able to identify who the audience is, I would say probably about half of the heresy that is being perpetrated today would be dealt with. You, you would be able to, to uh, just completely just be completely done away with. And, and I think that is so vitally important. I, th this message is really to empower people to be free. That is our heart's desire at the Freedom Center. That you're free. Not only are you free to uh, experience the fullness of God in your life, but that you're also free from the trappings and the manipulations that exist. It's like we're fighting a war on two fronts. One against the enemy who has non-believers in the dark. And another from those who have who have gotten lost 
in some way who have become carnal minded who who aspire to to achieve great financial success at the sacrifice of real faith of a genuine relationship with God one that has you smiling for no reason at all just because you know you're a friend of God we, we have to we, we have to get people to this place we have to get people into a, a relationship with God that doesn't have all the requirements that they've been presented that they don't have to pay for that there's no hundred dollar line a thousand dollar line there's simply no line at all because he lives in you bow your heads God, we thank you today. God, we love you so very much. And we're so thankful for your grace, your love, and your forgiveness. God, we know that your love has nothing to do with us, but everything to do with you. And we thank you for that. God, my prayer today for everyone who hears my voice that they would experience a freedom like they've never experienced before. I pray that your precious Holy Spirit would open their eyes so they may see, that they may know just how much you love them. That they may understand what you do require of them and what you don't. I pray for healing for those who have been hurt through false teaching and manipulative practices. And God, I pray for those who have done these things, God, that they would turn to you and that they would accept your grace, love, and forgiveness for their own lives, that in turn they may give it to others. God, I know that the church, that we can change, God, that we can glorify you and only you, and that the things of this world will no longer have a preeminent place and what we do but that the people become first and foremost in all that we aspire to accomplish I thank you for the strength and the courage to stand and speak now bless all those who hear us and bless them with the blessing of love in Jesus name I pray amen God bless Thank <laughs> you.